All right. Well, I'm uh, I'm going to talk about the third in the the third movie in the Harry Potter franchise. And uh, if you can if you can hear music coming coming uh, from some distant location, then uh, that's then I'm sorry. I I'm not alone in, in this house. Um, that's that's my brother. But uh, anyway, uh, basically. Let me let me uh, start start this off by saying that. <clears throat> remember how I said that Chamber of Secrets, its biggest flaw was that it did not take enough risks, and uh, what a lot of people had a problem with was the fact that it was uh, too similar to the first one. Well, new director. This could not be more different from the first two movies. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. The uh, the director Christopher Columbus, I believe, is reduced to a producing credit, and the uh, the new director is Alfonso Cuarón, who who uh, many people nowadays may know as the director of Gravity. So when I say that this could be more could not be any more different than the first two movies. That's I'm talking in terms of tone, in terms of lighting, in terms of direction, in t in terms of music. Everything about this one is just so different. And I'm not gonna lie, when I first saw this years ago, I didn't really like it as much as the first two. I mean, it just I mean, it didn't seem like it is just such a drastic change from. From the first two movies, which were pretty consistent with each other, I mean, it it just changes so much. Not really in terms of story or anything, but in terms of um, the points I just mentioned, the aspects I just mentioned, like uh, like like direction, the the writing, the 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 acting, the the overall atmosphere. It's it's darker. It's it's more fo foreboding, but uh, let me let me let me start with the acting because what better place is there to start? Um, well, the three main kids, uh, Daniel Radcliffe, Rupert Grint, and Emma Watson, are consistently getting better and better as the series goes on. Um, they still have that great chemistry, um, <clears throat> although it is kind of becoming more apparent that. Uh, that really, Hermione is more fit to deal with Harry's responsibilities than Harry is. Just on on a uh, on a confidence or a competence level, competence. So, <clears throat> but at the same time, I think that I think that was kind of the point. I think that the character of Harry Potter was was meant to be this kind of uh, everyman sort of character. This this just this kind of average guy who's thrust into these uh, into these very extraordinary situations and subsequently has to overcome. I think what what uh, I think where some of the criticisms come is is the is in the fact that that later on he's he's apparently this uh, this prophesized messiah. So. So I guess people don't don't really equate Messiah with the kind of everyman character that he was meant to be in the earlier stories. So so I don't necessarily think that makes him any less likable, but uh, but I do think it makes it uh, it makes it kind of con confusing as to why Hermione is not the protagonist. But what can you do? So, so yeah, this one, this one, the acting from the three main kids is, is better, and uh, the biggest, the biggest uh, gripe I have, really, in terms of the acting, is the fact that Richard Harris was not around anymore at the time of this movie. Richard Harris had just passed away. Um, so if they wanted to keep the franchise going, and trust me, they were going to keep this this money making franchise going. They needed to recast Dumbledore, and who they got is uh, Michael Gambon. 
And basically, on one hand, I, I, I have to say it is painfully obvious from the start that that um, Michael Gambon is not as good as Richard Harris in my mind. But at the same time, I'm really glad that he did not try to imitate Harris. I'm really glad that he really tried to put his own spin on the character. He does not, I mean, by no means does he, does he try to do an impression of Richard Harris. And, and this could also have, have something to do with, uh, with the way it's, it's written. I mean, it could be written slightly. I think it, it. I think the character of Dumbledore is written as slightly more, more uh, 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 alive this time around. Whereas, whereas Harris, Harris's portrayal, it was written and and acted basically like it is in the book, where where um, Dumbledore is this kind of uh, aged old old uh, sage like presence. Whereas Michael Gambon, this becomes clear. This becomes more and more clear as as the series goes on, but I think Michael Gambit's Dumbledore really, in my opinion, kind of resembles Gandalf, and I think that was that was uh, probably the biggest detriment to it, Richard Harris passing away is because in trying to reinvent the character of or not entirely reinvent but in trying to differentiate the character of Dumbledore from the way it was performed in the past, I think they they tread a little too close to Lord of the Rings territory. Because because uh, he is written uh, as slightly more vulnerable and uh, and slightly more like he's not entirely sure what he's doing like Gandalf and that and to be fair that's that's from the books. I mean Dumbledore is not is revealed later in the books to be to be not as invincible as he was once made out to be. But um but really, like I said, in terms of the acting and in terms of the writing, I think he he's a little too much like Gandalf. If I wanted to see Gandalf, I would watch The Lord of the Rings. And I have watched The Lord of the Rings many, many times. <clears throat> but at the same time, it's not, it's not an impression of Gandalf either. I mean, it's... Like I said, Gambit is putting his own spin on it. I just think it resembles Gandalf a little bit more than it resembles Dumbledore, and if he had just pushed it a little bit closer to Dumbledore, then without entirely doing without entirely doing a Richard Harris impression, then I would have then maybe I would have um, been a little bit uh, more a little bit more satisfied. But enough about that. Michael Gambon does a good job considering considering the big shoes he had to fill. <coughs> Uh, Alan Rickman is still is still very fun to watch. He is still very uh, he's still very entertainingly articulate as as uh, as Professor Snape. He is really he's still very precise in his performance. Um, Maggie Smith doesn't really get as much to do this time around. I think she's only in like a few scenes, but um, but she still she still perfectly inhabits uh, Professor McGonagall. She's a uh, she still, she still adds that uh, kind of lovable sternness to the character. Uh, who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? No, Kenneth Branagh this time around, sadly. <clears throat> but Robbie Coltrane is is still uh, is still a lot of fun as as Hagrid. He's a uh, he still got he still got a, a sense of mischief. He still I don't know. I just I just think Robbie Coltrane was is still very good as Hagrid, and uh, I think that brings me to some of the newer some of the newer cast members. Uh, we got David Thewlis as Professor Lupin, the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, who is both more charming and more competent than than either of the Dark Arts. Depends against the dark arts teachers before this. David Thewlis plays this perfectly. David Thewlis, he's, you know what he is? He's kind of like, he's kind of like a more, a more accomplished, a more physically accomplished version of Marcus Brody from the Indiana Jones movies. 
because because he's still got that that sense of uh, I I don't want to use a uh, I don't want to use an ignorant term here, but he's still got that sense of uh, sense of British. He's still got that British humor, but but at the same time, at the same time, you really do get a sense that he knows he knows what he's doing. He, you get the sense that this character has been about a bit. You get the sense that uh, Lupin really has has a lot has a lot of. Uh, experience in dealing with the dark arts so so a that makes it more fitting for him to be teaching the class and b that makes it uh, all the more all the more interesting when when uh, when he clearly possesses such a uh, good sense of humor as as he demonstrates during his scenes with Harry and good thing that he and Daniel Radcliffe has have plenty of chemistry too um, so yeah I really liked uh, David Thewlis as Professor Lupin <clears throat> but probably the biggest surprise is uh, the part of Sirius Black, who is the uh, the titular prisoner of Azkaban. He is he's an escaped convict who supposedly who supposedly um supported uh, Voldemort and uh, ratted out the Potter's location to Voldemort. So basically, he is essentially the primary reason that Harry's parents are dead, and he is played by Gary Oldman. Geez, talk about star power. I mean, they're... I mean, obviously, the other movies had plenty of star power, but Gary Oldman is the last guy I would expect to be in these movies. <laughs> um, but he's he's very good. He's he's very good at playing, at playing the... Uh, he gives such a layered performance in this movie with the relatively short amount of screen time that he's given. He's good at playing the very crazy prisoner side of Sirius Black, but also very good at playing the uh, wrongfully convicted and uh, and very sympathetic um, innocent man. I hope I'm not giving anything away here by saying that, but um, he's he's he just he just uh, accomplishes a whole lot with with what uh, with how little screen time he's given, and it's not like he's only in one scene. I mean, he's basically in the last third of the movie, but but still, that's two thirds of the movie that he's not in. So so when I when I have such high praise for him in in such a uh, in such a little amount of screen time, part of that is due to part of that is due to the writing, but most of it is due to Gary Oldman's performance. Gary Oldman does such a good job in this, and. I really cannot imagine anyone else as Sirius Black. So, so yeah, real, real props to Gary Oldman. And and I mentioned before how at first I didn't like this one when when I first saw it because because like I said I was just very jarred by the contrast that it has with the previous movies in the series. <clears throat> but uh, since then it it's kind of grown on me. I've I've come to appreciate it as something, as something very different. I mean, they were clearly trying to do something different, and they and they obviously succeeded. I like I like some of the uh, I like some of the new directions that they take with some of the characters. And something that I've also noticed fairly recently is that there are a lot of weird moments in this movie. There are a lot of moments where where something will happen on screen, or a character, or a concept, or a creature will be introduced. Um, that everyone except for Harry just just feels is completely normal. <laughs> I mean, it really just this movie does have a sense of humor about about some of the more some of the more uh, quote unquote out there stuff of these of this uh, wizarding world. So so let, let, I'm trying to think of some examples because uh, okay, so at one point Harry. What, Harry runs away from the Dursleys, and he and he's and all of a sudden this this big double decker bus comes out of nowhere, um, high speed. It's it's kind of like the Flash, where it's where it's this kind of high speed like zoom and and comes to, and immediately stops. And this and this very this very lanky, dirty guy comes out and says like, 
comes out and says like the night bus devoted to uh, to rescuing the stranded witch or wizard my name is Stan Shunpike and I will be your conductor for this evening and just this this guy is just so weird and this whole concept this whole the whole atmosphere of the bus is just so weird it's this very because as Harry steps onto the bus um, there are all these beds that are not attached to anything so as the bus is kind of swerving through the city these beds are, are flying or rolling all over the place and the and the wizards in the beds are just kind of sleeping they're just sleeping they're not they're not they're not being roused by the uh, bumpy ride or anything they're not uh, <laughs> they're not freaked out by the fact by the fact that this bus is going like 200 miles per hour possibly faster <laughs> and it's never it's never touched upon. They treat it as if it's completely normal. The only one like I said, this is where the character of Harry Potter comes in. The only one who thinks this is at all out of the ordinary is the audience proxy, Harry Potter. Who eventually he just kind of accepts it because he, he knows that this this weird this odd guy, this, this Stan Shunpike, it's clearly not going to give him any kind of answers. Um, what, what else, what else, what else? Okay, he, Harry visits the Minister of Magic. He's visited by the Minister of Magic at the uh, second-rate uh, boarding house that, that he's staying at, or possibly third-rate boarding house. And the Minister of Magic comes in and... and uh, Offering Harry food is apparently this minute the minister has this kind of Igor assistant, this this bald Igor like assistant who who keeps trying to offer Harry food, and this guy is never once mentioned. It's never mentioned once why this guy, why this guy is so scary looking, why this guy is so weird. <laughs> And one final thing I want to touch upon is is uh, Emma Thompson shows up as the uh, divination teacher, and and she is just she's clearly having a lot of fun because he's she's she's making all these these very guttural noises. She's she's prancing around. He she's she's like broaden your minds. She's hamming it up, but but um, the thing is, the movie never mentions her. Men never mentions her being eccentric. The movie never. In all honest, in all honesty, it's um. It might be a little off-putting for the uninitiated, but um. There there are so many moments like that where it's just something will happen that is just so strange. And I keep using this word, but just so weird and so just out of nowhere that that I cannot help but but be swept up in the kind of quirky in the kind of uh, in the kind of quirky off kilter humor that Quaron seems to be going for. And I and to be honest, I think Quaron handles this kind of uh, this kind of stuff better than Tim Burton does because Tim Burton does this a lot. But but honestly, I think Quaron does it a lot better. And and uh, and speaking of Quaron, he he directs this he directs this to be just a tonal departure from the previous two movies because the previous two movies they could get dark, but from from frame one this this thing this movie the colors are somewhat dimmed. I mean everything has this very grayish blue filter to it. Hogwarts Hogwarts does. You still recognize it as the same location, but you see different you see different angles in different places in this school, and the way that it's filmed and the way that they kind of uh, design some of these new locations or these new subsections in the Hogwarts, it honestly looks very gothic. It looks like they it looks like they took took a very gothic inspiration. At times, some of the time, Hogwarts looks like Castle Dracula. <sighs> It looks like they, I don't, I don't exactly know where this thing was filmed, but, 
But uh, I could... I... And I'm not saying this... And I... I'm probably wrong on this, but it honestly looks like they filmed it in Prague or Transylvania or somewhere or somewhere like that. But yeah, yeah, I I was uh this was certainly an unexpected entry in the Harry Potter series, but in my opinion after after it has grown on me I think it's it's a welcome change, and I think it's a real credit to to uh, the director and uh, and a lot of people involved who are willing to just go so far. I mean, I mean, it's a real credit to to everyone involved who were just willing to take such a departure from what was established in the first two movies. Just in term, I mean, in terms of in terms of lighting, in terms of tone, in terms of basically everything. <sighs> I think it was just such a bold move on their part. And and yeah, it is pretty jarring to go from the second movie to this, when this has a noticeably grimmer look to it. It's it has a much it has a noticeably dirtier look. But but I didn't really I wasn't really saying this is not pleasing to the eye. It's very it's very um it has this very dark it has this uh, dark style to it that I think benefits the the setting. So yeah, I like Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and uh, after this, after this came my possibly my favorite of the books, uh, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire.